round of applause for the end. I'm like, I'll earn it. <laughs> Hi, my name is Vince Mariotti. I'm here representing the Roberto Clemente Museum, which is in the Lawrenceville section of Pittsburgh. <laughs> and some technical difficulties. Again, next. This is the Roberto Clemente Museum. It's a former Pittsburgh City Firehouse, a unique location for a museum. This firehouse was initially built in 1896. If you think back to 1896, fire equipment. Fire engines were not propelled by motors, they were pulled by horses. There used to be stables in the back and off to the side. They are long since gone. Horses were at a premium as far as fire engines and firehouses are concerned. So the firemen had to be well versed not only in putting out fires and life saving techniques, they had to know how to take care of horses as well. We recently received from a donor a Pittsburgh Bureau of Fire handbook from 1897 which has some interesting points on care of horses. The firemen shall keep stable and harnessed neat and clean and have their horses at all times ready for immediate use. You never knew when a fire was going to come in. And exercising the horses, they shall not go more than one block distant from their respective houses. Again, you never knew when a call was going to go out, so you had to make sure that the horses were close to the firehouse. I find this very interesting. In cold or wet weather, on arriving at a fire, the blanket shall be immediately put on the horses, and if the apparatus, apparatus is placed in service, the driver shall take the horses to the nearest place of security and immediately return to his company for duty. In other words, make sure the horses are safe, then you go into harm's way. And last but not least, in returning from fires, drivers shall not drive faster than a walk. This firehouse is a continuous operation in the city of Pittsburgh until the early 1970s. The early 1970s, the fire hall was getting a little bit long in the tooth, needed some repairs. The front doors, as you notice right here, were becoming a little bit too small for the fire equipment at the time. So the city of Pittsburgh decides that they're going to close this building down. 1972 was the last day the firemen were in this building. The last day the firemen were in this building was December 31st, 1972. Also happened to be the same day that Roberto Clemente tragically lost his life in a humanitarian area, humanitarian air accident, which we'll be talking about a little bit later. One of the few eerie coincidences Linky the Great went to this building, despite the fact that he was probably never in it. In 1974, the city of Pittsburgh is going to raise this building. They didn't get around to it. Is it a surprise to anybody? Well, I hope there's no one who works for the city of Pittsburgh here. I apologize. They don't get around to it. For the next 20 years, the city of Pittsburgh uses it as essentially a large storage facility. Parks and Recreation, Emergency Medical Services uses it to store stuff. It falls into further disrepair. In the early 1990s, Dwayne Reeder, the owner-curator of the museum, you have an opportunity to meet him when you do come to visit the Roberto Clemente Museum. He's a professional photographer, a commercial photographer. He's looking to expand his photography studio. He's aware that Firehouse Number 25 in the Lawrenceville section of Pittsburgh is for sale. He goes and decides he's going to buy it. Now, in 1992, a Dwayne Reader had asked me, hey Vince, I think I'm gonna buy Firehouse Number 25 and convert it to a photography studio. I said, Dwayne, when you're smoking, you're out of your mind. This place was in disarray, it was a mess. Holes in the ceiling, flocks of pigeons, homeless people, rats, it was a disaster. That's the difference between someone like Dwayne Reader, who's an artist, who can see the things for the potential they have. I mean, this building was built in 1896. Look at the turrets in the back. They don't build buildings like this. And someone like myself, who's got a firm grasp of the obvious. It also helps that Dwayne is a master of all trades. He can do plumbing work. He can do electrical work. He can do drywalling. He starts the conversion process. Over the next few years, he's working to convert this building to a photography studio. In 1994, the Pittsburgh Pirates are hosting the All-Star Game at Three Rivers Stadium. If you've ever been to an All-Star Game, it's much, much more than the game itself. They have a home run hitting contest, they have a traveling exhibit from the Hall of Fame, they've got a futures game which, start, which fits the best minor league baseball players. They used to have a celebrity and old-timer softball game. They have a traveling exhibit called Fan Fest, which is a week-long celebration of baseball. In 1994, the Steel the Pirates decide that they want to highlight Roberto Clemente's career. 
so they commission a calendar. Wayne Reader, the professional photographer, gets the contract for this calendar. The calendar is going to have pictures of Roberto Clemente, his highlights, as far as his career are concerned, and pictures of his memorabilia and awards. At that time, the early 1990s, where is the biggest collection of Roberto Clemente, Roberto Clemente memorabilia in the world? Probably where it is right now, it is home in Puerto Rico. His wife, Vera, has never remarried. His three sons, Roberto Jr., Luis, and Ricky, Enrique, are firmly committed to the Roberto Clemente legacy. Wayne goes down there, he meets the Clemente family, a remarkably warm, giving family. They have trouble with the word no. They give him various information. He strikes up a lifelong friendship with the Clementes. The All-Star Game, as you know, is a big hit. They uh, introduced the Roberto Clemente statue, which was positioned at Three River Stadium, and has since been moved to PNC Park, right at the end of the uh, Roberto Clemente Bridge. Turn the another picture of the front doors as far as the Clemente Museum is concerned. This is a picture of the museum when Dwayne decided he was going to purchase it. You notice the broken windows. It was, it was a mess. They started the conversion process. This is the first floor. When they gutted everything out, he was cleaning it out. Next. That's the second floor. Right here we have a fire pole. They had two fire poles there. When I'm giving tours at the museum, I'm going to tell people, despite the fact we don't have funding in place, the answer to the question is no. Once we get up to the second floor, we cannot exit to the first floor using the fire pole. <laughs> Inevitably, I get that question asked by a young guy. Next. Here started the conversion process, started cleaning it out. You notice on the wall over there is an exact mock-up of Game 7, 1960 World Series, Forbes Field. Next. I better look at that. Next. This is a refinished upstairs, remarkable work. I can't imagine the man hours and time and energy Dwayne did to converting this museum. Next. Also, Dwayne is a master of all trades. He also has a winery at the Roberto Clemente Museum. Here's a picture of the winery downstairs. Next. Okay, another one. Quite a few celebrities own barrels of wine down there. This is the Reba, the outside of the restaurant. Next. Again. Okay. So that gives you a flavor as far as Dwayne Reader and the Roberto Clemente Museum and how the museum came to be. In 2006, the Pirates are hosting the All-Star Game again, this time at PNC Park. Dwayne has made annual visits to the Clemente family. He's fast friends with the Clementes. Vera Clemente gets in contact with Dwayne before the All-Star Game and asks, Dwayne, my family and I are coming up for the All-Star Game. Can we use your photography studio as a site for a party? Dwayne says, of course we are. That's no problem whatsoever. So Dwayne gets to thinking, you know, I've got all this great Roberto Clemente memorabilia awards. After we met the Clementes, that we can do this interest in the Pirates and Clemente, and he started collecting stuff. Wouldn't it be nice if I displayed some of this prior to Vera and the family coming up? So he works feverishly, starts displaying some of the awards and his memorabilia. Roberto and the family come up. They have a big party, the Clemente family's there, former players that played with Roberto were there, uh, current Pittsburgh Pirates in 2006 were there, Pittsburgh City Big Wigs. After the party was over, Barry approaches Dwayne and says, Dwayne, thank you very much, this was phenomenal. You know, this place looks like a museum. And that's what started the conversion process. I find it quite ironic that since 2006, what was once a two-floor photography studio, a full four, floor and a half is devoted to the Roberto Clemente Museum. That's Dwayne's commitment to Roberto Clemente and the museum. Okay, 1927. 1927, this is still a firehouse. The Pittsburgh Pirates are playing the New York Yankees in the World Series. This is Babe Ruth's New York Yankees. Arguably one of the best teams to play Major League Baseball. They sweep the Pirates in four games. Well, anyway, everybody's heard Babe Ruth stories. Babe Ruth was larger than life. Babe Ruth did everything in excess. Eating, drinking, smoking, ladies, you name it. Everything was sex in excess. There was always a circus around Babe Ruth. Lou Gehrig was kind of the office. College guy, kind of quiet, sedate, not big into the party scene. There was a fireman at Firehouse Number 25 in 1927, a guy by the name of Zip Sloan. Zip Sloan was a former baseball player, played minor league baseball with Lou Gehrig. Zip Sloan was a pitcher in the Detroit Tiger organization, blew out an elbow or shoulder, I don't know which it was. 
back in the 1920s, surgery wasn't nearly what it is right now. Zips phones out of baseball. He comes back to Pittsburgh. He is a fireman at firehouse number 25. He's well aware that the Yankees are in town for the World Series. He knows Lou Gehrig. He knows Babe Ruth. He gets in contact with Lou and says, hey, Lou, if you want to avoid that Babe Ruth circus for a day, why don't you come out to firehouse number 25 and spend the night here at the firehouse? Lou Gehrig agrees. So when you come to visit the Roberto Clemente Museum, when we're up on the second floor, which was used to be the bathhouse and the bunkhouse for the firemen, we'll be walking where, Bay, where Lou Gehrig spent the night, kind of like George Washington slept here, only Lou Gehrig was there for the night. I find it interesting that in baseball, you have to be out of baseball for five years before you're considered for induction in the Hall of Fame. That's been waived for a number of players, but only two players have been voted in prior to the five-year waiting period. That is Roberto Clemente and Lou Gehrig. Okay. Here's some of the memorabilia we have at the museum. Dwayne probably has about seven or eight game used bats from Roberto Clemente. Next. Okay, again, World Series pass from 1960. <coughs> Game use spikes, Roberto Clemente. Some of these things are invaluable. One of his contracts, we'll be talking about contracts pretty soon. Next. That is not one of Roberto Clemente's gloves, but that is one of his baseball cards. Next. One of game use bats. Next. One of his jerseys, I can't begin to imagine. This is from the 1968 season, but Dwayne had a pretty good this. Next. Interesting. Anybody who thinks the Pirates are dead is in a room for awakening. This is Danny Murtaugh, who was the manager of the Pittsburgh Pirates. This was from the 1971 World Series. The Pirates lost the first two games in that series. We'll be talking that a little bit later. And this was his comment. How prophetic is that? Next. Get some more stuff next. Yeah, yeah. Some tickets to the World Series. This is the most expensive ticket. Game 7, 1960 World Series. 11 bucks. Most expensive ticket. <laughs> Get some, bought, some bleacher seats for $2.20 in 1960 World Series. Next. Another game used jersey. Next. 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 There's a reproduction of the statue, which is outside of PNC Park. Next. San Juan, this is the last jersey that Roberto wore prior to his death in 1972. We'll be talking about that in a little bit. Next. All right. It's. 1954, Roberto Clemente is senior in high school. He's being heavily recruited by Major League Baseball. Roberto Clemente is a star track and field and baseball athlete in high school. Major League Baseball was hovering. They were waiting for him. Back then, the rule was you could not sign a player until they turned 18 years of age. They were hovering for Roberto Clemente. Three teams were particularly interested. The Brooklyn Dodgers, now the Los Angeles Dodgers, the New York Giants, now the San Francisco Giants, and the Milwaukee Braves, now the Atlanta Braves. Roberto wanted to play in New York. Higher Hispanic population, he thought he'd feel a little bit more comfortable. He did not want to go to Milwaukee. I'm sure if you'd asked Roberto in 54, do you want to go to Pittsburgh? He said, no, for the same reason. So, these three teams are hovering. Milwaukee really didn't have too much of a chance. But they had a rule that as soon as a player turned 18, and Roberto turned 18 in August, you could offer him a baseball contract and a signing bonus. But the signing bonus could not exceed $6,000. Now, this story is kind of a little bit boring, but this gives you a flavor for how Roberto became a Pittsburgh Pirate. The New York Giants offer Roberto a contract and a $6,000 signing bonus. The Brooklyn Dodgers offer Roberto a contract and a $10,000 signing bonus, meaning that the Brooklyn Dodgers have to keep Roberto Clemente on their major league roster throughout the entire 54 season or risk losing him to a supplemental draft. Okay. Now, back in the 1950s, the Brooklyn Dodgers were a very good team. They're perennial national champions. They're in the World Series at least four times. They lose three ends of the Yankees. But they're a powerhouse. There's no room on the Brooklyn Dodgers in 1954 for a talented rookie, no matter how good he is. So what does Brooklyn do? try to do? They send Roberto to the minor leagues. They send him to Montreal and the International League, and they don't play him too often. They're going to hide him. 
They're hoping that during the course of the 54 season, everybody's going to forget about Roberto Clemente, and they're going to be able to sneak him in at the end of the 54 season. Well, I find that rather ironic because the general manager of the Pittsburgh Pirates in 1954 is this man, Branch Rickey. Branch Rickey should bring a bell to everybody because Branch Rickey is the major league executive who broke the color barrier. Signed Jackie Robinson in 1945. Jackie Robinson played in Montreal for 46, made his major league debut in 1947. He's the major league executive who signed Jackie Robinson. He worked for the Brooklyn Dodgers. He's now general manager of the Pittsburgh Pirates. So the Brooklyn Dodgers are trying to hide Roberto Clemente from a guy who used to work with him. I just find it very weird. At the end of the 54 season, who's the worst team in Major League Baseball? Pittsburgh. Our Pittsburgh Pirates. If you think the Pirates were bad during a recent 20-year losing streak, it pales in comparison to what we suffered with the Pirates back then. They were just abysmal. From World War II straight through the 1950s, they were a bad, bad team. So, when the supplemental draft came up, who has the number one pick? Pittsburgh Pirates. And who do the Pirates select? Roberto Clemente. That's how Roberto Clemente gets to be a Pittsburgh Pirate. So he's now a Pittsburgh Pirate. Okay. Now, the Pirates had an obligation to keep Roberto on their 1955 team all year or risk losing him in the draft. Well, that's the Pirates for the problem for the Pirates. The Pirates are a bad team. They can have a raw young kid on their team. It's not going to impact their standings. Here we have Bill Hodges, a Dodger, and Ralph Kine, a power hitting outfielder for the Pittsburgh Pirates. Do you want to turn it? Keep you busy. Right. Another one. And another one. One more. One. We stuck? Kind of, why are you trying to figure it out? Well, okay, go back. <laughs> okay, no, you're way, way. All right, so at the end of his rookie season, 1955, Roberto Clemente, the Pirates mail out his contract to him in Puerto Rico at his home, expecting him to dutifully sign the contract and send it back. Before free agentry, baseball clubs had all the power when it came to negotiations. Everybody had a one-year contract. Babe Ruth, Lou Gehrig. Lou Brock, everybody has a one-year contract because the teams don't have to worry about losing them. The player remained with the team, called the reserve clause, throughout their career, unless the team traded them or cut them. So the team had all the power. Branch Rickey was a notoriously tough negotiator. To give you an example of how tough a negotiator Branch Rickey was, we just saw a picture of Ralph Kine. Ralph Kine is in the Hall of Fame, longtime announcer for the New York Mets, recently passed. Ralph Kiner leads or ties a National League in home runs seven times. Came time for contract to come out, and Ralph Kiner wants a face-to-face -face meeting with Branch Rickey. He wants a raise. So they have a meeting, and I'm paraphrasing right now, but Ralph Kiner asks Branch Rickey for a raise. I've led the league in home run X amount of times. I think I deserve a raise. Branch Rickey responds, again, I'm paraphrasing, I'm well aware of what you've done, Mr. Kiner, but you're not going to get a raise. Ralph Kiner asks, why? Branch Rickey responds, well, Mr. Kiner, what place did the Pittsburgh Pirates finish this year? Last. We could have done that without your home runs. <laughs> Ralph Kiner does not get a raise. At the end of the 55 season, they mail Roberto Clemente his 56th contract. He had a so-so year as far as 55 is concerned. Roberto sends it back, and they're expecting Roberto to do what most players do. You dutifully sign on the line, send the contract back. Well, Roberto doesn't sign. He sends a contract back and says, no, the contract was $7,000. You got a $1,000 raise. His first year salary was $6,000. Now I realize $6,000 in 1955 goes a lot further than it goes right now. But again, major league salaries pale in comparison back then to what they are right now. I think major league minimum last year was $535,000. The average Major League Baseball player made four and a half million dollars. For example, Roberto Clemente played for 18 seasons. If you total up all his salaries for 18 seasons, it comes to a little over $750,000. And he made $150,000 in 1972. So the money wasn't there as far as players are concerned. Now when players get free agent free, they sit down, 
with the clubs, they have attorneys, they have agents, and they negotiate multi-million dollar contracts, multi-year guaranteed contracts. Back then, as I said, only one-year contracts because the players could go nowhere. The clubs had all the power. Well, anyway, Roberto gets it. They mail the contract to Roberto, $7,000. Roberto sends it back and says, no, I want $10,000. Now, he's sending this letter, he wants $10,000 to Branch Ricky, the guy who told Ralph Kiner, no rentals. This is a young, 19, 20-year-old Latin kid sending back to Branch Ricky saying, I'm not accepting this contract, I want 10,000 bucks. Well, we've got the response letter at the museum, and when you're there, you've got to read it. I any wonder that Branch Ricky didn't have an aneurysm when he wrote that. In a letter, he writes, you're not that good. We've got many players better than you are. Uh, Branch Ricky, the manager, doesn't even know who you are. The only reason you were on the team all year is because we had to keep you on the team all year. Probably the biggest insult of all, who's ever giving you this advice as, far as, advice as far as contract negotiation? Don't listen to that person. They don't know what they're talking about. As if a young Latin player is not bright enough to do this. Then he concludes it by saying, I'm sending you another contract for $7,500, but we're not negotiating. He sends that contract to Roberto. Roberto sends that one back and says, no, I want $10 thousand dollars. Eventually they split the difference and Roberto gets eighty five hundred dollars for a second year. Which is amazing considering he's negotiating with Branch Ricky, the guy who told Ralph Kiner no. So it gives you a flavor as far as how persuasive Roberto Clemente could be. Okay. Oh we're ready to go back. <coughs> Keep going. Back, 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 Okay. One more. Okay. Go forward. When Berto broke into Major League Baseball, all of us said that we were Roberto Clemente fans and we treated him well. Nothing could be further from the truth. The fans in the press were particularly brutal to Roberto Clemente. They called him the Puerto Rican hot dog. They said he was standoffish, he was aloof, didn't communicate to too many people. No one stopped to realize that this is a 20, 21 year old Latin kid. English is a second language. What does he have in common with a team full of white American baseball players other than baseball? The press was particularly brutal. Roberto spoke with an accent, I heat the ball. And in the paper they would write, Roberto said he H E A T the B O L L. Latin players back in the 50s and 60s were marginalized. Right now we make provisions for players from different cultures. In Jungo Gung, our third baseman from South Korea, is a classic example of that. When Jungo Gung broke into Major League Baseball when he signed a contract for the Pirates, he was on the opening day roster in April 2015. He didn't play much in April. And people were saying, why don't they send Jung Ho Gung down to the minor leagues to get him some practice? Well, the Pirates, I think, didn't do that for two reasons. Number one, they were aware he was ready for prime time. And number two, they didn't want to send him down to Indianapolis, get an apartment, work into the routines there, despite the fact they had a couple of interpreters, then uproot him, bring him to Pittsburgh, and have a second adjustment. Roberto Clemente didn't have it. He was essentially on his own as far as that's concerned. And, and the uh, discrimination against Roberto even persisted later in his career. In the late 1960s, they were interviewing a sports writer in the Pittsburgh area, a guy by the name of Joe Tronzo. Joe Tronzo had covered the Pirates in the 30s, 40s, 50s, and they asked Roberto, they asked him, isn't Roberto Clemente the best right fielder the Pirates have ever? Joe Tronzo responds, no, he's the third best. Third best. Well, Joe, who's the best? Paul Wainer, he said. Paul Wainer played for the Pirates, right field, 20s, 30s, 40s, outstanding ball player, 3,000 hits in the Hall of Fame. Okay. Paul Wainer is the best right fielder. But you said Roberto is the third best. Who's the second best right fielder in Pirates history? Joe responds, Paul Wainer drunk. In his opinion, even an inebriated Paul Wayne was a better right fielder than Roberto. So give you kind of a flavor for what Roberto had endured as part of his career, and he did it with dignity. In 1958, the Pittsburgh Pirates are in first place. It's May. 
Pittsburgh's going crazy. The Pirates haven't smelled for a second place in years. A letter appears at Forbes Field addressed to Roberto Clemente. It's from the draft board. Roberto has to report for a physical. Now, Puerto Rican citizens are citizens of the United States. Now, Joe Al Brown, who's now the general manager, branch where he's gone, I'm sure his heart sunk in his chest. Here is my up and coming star, and I'm going to lose him to the military service. The 1960 Pittsburgh Pirates, we have a team picture of them right there. 16 of those guys lost at least part of one season to the major league, to the draft, to the armed services. So, what they do is start a series of Western Union telegrams with the draft board. That was kind of like the texting of the day back then. But anyway, first thing I'm going to do is reschedule the physical because Roberto is out in California with the Pirates playing the Los Angeles Dodgers. Then they want to see if they can pull some strings and get Roberto out of this. So what's finally decided is that at the end of the 58 season, Roberto Clemente is going to report to Paris Island and be a member of the Marine Reserve. Do we have any Marines here? When Roberto Clemente reported they were doing physical fitness testing, Roberto did 54 consecutive pull-ups. The Marine BI stopped them and said, stop, you've got the Marine record. Now, I don't know what the Marine record is now, but at that particular time, Roberto Clemente had it. Roberto Clemente is an expert marksman. He's almost immediately made a squad leader because of his leadership skills. The Marines, at, in his company, and the Marines knew him as Roberto Clemente Walker. We in Pittsburgh know him as Roberto Walker Clemente. But formally, in Spanish and, Southern, and Central American culture, the father's last name comes first, then the mother's last name. So officially, he's Roberto Clemente Walker. In his Marine Rear book, which we have at the museum, there's a photograph of him, and as Roberto C. Walker. Also, when Roberto was inducted in the Hall of Fame, if ever you've been to Cooperstown, they have a gigantic exhibit with all the plaques of the inductees in the Hall of Fame on the wall. Roberto Clemente, when they were having his induction, they unveiled the plaque and his family said, no, you've got it wrong. The plaque said, Roberto Walker Clemente. The family says, no, 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 no. The plaque should read, Roberto Clemente Walker. The Hall of Fame has restruck that plaque. Roberto Clemente is the only player that I'm aware of, there might be others, who has two Hall of Fame plaques. In the main hall where they have all the inductees plaque is the correct Roberto Clemente Walker plaque. And we had a couple of people at the tours recently at the museum, even recently at Cooperstown, and they had said that there's a section of the museum kind of devoted towards children. And in that section of the museum is where the Roberto Walker Clemente plaque is. While Roberto is at basic training, the long arm of the IRS, how appropriate because it's tax season, reaches out and grabs Roberto. He owes taxes. The 1958 Pirates finished in second place. Every player gets a thousand dollars. While Roberto's in basic training, he's made aware that he owes taxes on this money. Well, he's in basic training, so what he does is he writes a letter to Joel Brown, the general manager, essentially saying, hey Joe, please pay these taxes. I'll reimburse you when I get out. The fascinating thing about uh, what I find about this letter, and we have it on display at the museum, is how Roberto addressed it. Roberto addresses it to Joel Brown, Pittsburgh Pirates, General Manager, Forbes Field, PA. No street address, no Pittsburgh, PA. Forbes Field, PA, and the post office delays. Okay. Again, we going the right way? Are we going the right way? There we go. Thank you. Okay. It's 1964. Roberto Clemente always had a sense of urgency as far as life is concerned. He thought. He had a premonition that he was going to die young, and believe it or not, he thought he was going to die in an air accident over water. So once Roberto made up his mind about something, he was bound to determine it was going to happen. So, 19, he's in his late 20s, and he's decided it's time to settle down. So he's in Puerto Rico, touring in his big white Cadillac. He sees this pretty girl walking down the street, and it's his future white bear. He's intrigued. He parks the car. He follows her into a drugstore. Starts talking to her. Now, this is 1964. Roberto's at the height of his popularity. Everybody in Puerto Rico knows him. Vera is well aware that she's talking to Roberto for Monday. Roberto asks her on a date. Vera says, no. She comes from a very strict family, and she knows without proper introduction, this is not going to happen. She leaves to go back to work. She was working in a bank at the time. Roberto starts chatting up the drugstore. Who's that girl? What's her family like? Where does she live? 
He contacts Farrah a few more times asking for a date, and Roberto and Barry just tell him, no, I can't have it. Eventually, Roberto befriends a neighbor of the Zabala family. That is, they're his family, happen to be a school teacher. And in exasperation one day, this school teacher goes into the Zavala house and essentially says, please, you've got to do something to get Roberto to meet Vera. He's driving me crazy. He's calling me 20 times a day. So they make arrangements for a date. The date is Vera's going to accompany Roberto to a Winter League baseball game. Roberto is playing Winter League baseball. Back before free agentry, before the big money, many of the players had jobs in the offseason. They didn't make too much money. Now, Roy Face, who was a relief pitcher for the 60 Pirates, was a carpenter. Many of the Pirates would go down to South America and Central America, where the seasons are opposite ours, and play baseball to earn a little extra money, sharpen their baseball skills. So, Barron's going to accompany Roberto to one of his Winter League baseball games. So, Roberto pulls up in the big Cadillac, out walks Vera, and Vera's sister, and a few other people. They're all going to the game. This is going to be, she's going to be with a group, an entourage. They pile into the car. Everybody's in the back seat. <laughs> now you're all too young to remember 1960 era's cabinets. But those things were huge. I swear to goodness, they were land ships. They didn't have emergency brakes, they had anchors, being facetious. So they're all in the back seat. Roberto's in the bear. Why don't you come up and sit with me in the front seat? So we're like the little bear gets up, sits in the front seat, as far away from Roberto as possible, leaning against the passenger seat door. They go to the game. The game's rained out. Now Roberto's excited because. If he's playing baseball and she's in the stands with her entourage, he's not going to have an opportunity to spend much time with her. But the game's rained out. So Roberto proposes, you know what? We can do something else. To which the response was, no. We've got permission to go to a baseball game. The baseball game's been canceled. We have to go home. End of first day. Eventually, the fam family relinquished. They started dating. And Roberto asks for Vera's hand in marriage. Roberto said, Vera says, I have to get my father's permission. Fathers back in the 60s are a little bit more strict than we are right now. And according to Vera, her, her father was strict by 1960 standards. So, Roberta goes to the house. Now, I, don't, I can't verify this, but I've heard that Roberta had a friend right outside the house in a car ready to get to, in case he had made a quick getaway. He asks Mr. Zavala for Vera's hand in marriage, and Mr. Zavala says, you know what, Roberto, I don't get it. You're a rich, famous baseball player. You probably know more women more beautiful than my Vera. <laughs> Thanks, Dan. More a humble family. <laughs> Thanks. Why? And Roberto wasn't bragging. He wasn't being facetious. He said, yeah, Mrs. Zabola, you're right. I could probably go to the corner now and get 10 girls, but I don't care. The one I love is here. You know, Matt and A.I. New Hampshire, well-known as well as Puerto Rico. He's a hero. I'm sure the girls were interested in Roberto Clemente. So he tells. This is the ball up, so the one he loves is here. They make arrangements for the wedding. The wedding's in November of 1964. Roberta's 30 years old, which is old in 1960 standards for guys to get married. Over 800 people at the wedding, including the governor of Puerto Rico. One of the events of Puerto Rico at that time. We actually have an invitation from the wedding at the museum. Unfortunately for the person who received that invitation, he had just gotten a job in New York City and couldn't get released time for that. Now remember, Roberta's a happily married man. They skip ahead. He's got a sense of urgency as far as life is concerned. So, he wants to start a family as soon as possible. So in quick succession, the Clementes have three sons, Roberto Jr., Luis, and Enrique, the baby. Now, the Clementes weren't married that long. They are married in 64, he dies in 72. They are only married eight years. Occasionally, the boys I've heard will tease their mother, saying she hasn't had so much as a luncheon date since Dad had that. That's so committed the Clementes are as far as the Roberto Clemente legacy and uh, their affiliation with their father. Now in 1960, the Pittsburgh Pirates were playing the New York Yankees in the World Series at Forbes Field. Now, the experts say that the Pittsburgh Pirates don't have a chance. The Yankees are loaded. <laughs> Mickey Mantle, Yogi Berra, Roger Maris, Whitey Ford, Moose Gowran, in the 1950s alone, the New York Yankees have been in World Series eight times. They've won six of them. They finished the 1960 season winning some obscene 13, 14 games in a row. They went away with the ALC, the AI title. The Pittsburgh Pirates, in contrast, this is the first time they're in the series in 33 years. The experts say the Pirates should just be happy to be in the World Series. 
The series opens at Forbes Field. The Pirates win the first game 6-4. Surprise. The experts are stunned. Then they say, you know what? Even a blind, a, even a blind squirrel gets an acorn case. Maybe it's a fluke. The Yankees win the next two games in the World Series by scores of 16 to 3, 10 to nothing. They outscore the Pirates 26 to 3 in the next game. They slaughter the Pirates. Then the experts are crowing. See, we told you, the Pirates are an inferior team. There's no way they're going to be able to rebound from this drubbing, particularly since the series is going back to Yankee Stadium. They have the grave dug for the Pirates. They have thrown the Pirates in the grave. They're shoveling dirt on them. They're done. Well, the Pirates win game four and game five in New York. Close games, but they win them. The series comes back to Ford Field for game six. The Pirates lose that game 12 to nothing. Game seven, we all know about game seven. That's a seesaw affair. The Pirates win. Bill Mazeroski has a walk-off home run in the bottom of the ninth. David is saying Goliath. The Pirates are World Series champions. The New York Brass is so upset with the outcome of this series that they fire their manager, Casey Stingle. Now, Casey Stingle was the manager of the Pirates in the 50s. He's led the Yankees to eight World Series. They've won six of them. They say that he did not take the Pirates seriously enough. And one of the main reasons is starting pitching. In seven game World Series, we've got a baseball coach back here. You have your best pitcher pitch game one. He's available to pitch game four. He's available to pitch game seven. That's exactly what the Pirates do. Bernard Law is their best pitcher. 1960, he's a Cy Young Award winner in the National League. He pitches game one, the Pirates win game one. He pitches game four, the Pirates win game four. He starts game seven. He holds the Yankees scoreless for four innings. Then the Yankees get to him, he's out of the game. But at least he's available for game seven. Yankees' best pitcher in 1960, make no mistake about it, is Whitey Ford. Whitey Ford's in the Hall of Fame. Does Whitey Ford start game one? No. Does Whitey Ford start game two? No. Whitey Ford doesn't start until game three. And if you remember, the Yankees shut out the Pirates 10 0 in game three. Whitey Ford's spot in the rotation comes up again in game six. And if you remember, Whitey Ford shuts out the Pirates 12 0. Buddy Ford has pitched two complete game shutouts against the Pittsburgh Pirates in the World Series. The Pirates haven't a clue. So the experts are saying, you know what? If Casey Stengel pitches Whitey Ford in game one, he's available game four, he's available game seven, the series results are different. You know what I say? Coulda, woulda, shoulda, it didn't happen. These 1960 Pirates were a destined team. I've heard that over 20 times in the 1960 season, they came, scored the winning runs in their last at-bats. They were just a destined team. In 1990, they were having their reunion of these 1960 Pittsburgh Pirates, and they're talking to a guy by the name of Dick Schofield on a backup shortstop for the team. And that's what they were asking. Dick Schofield, how did the Pittsburgh Pirates beat the 60 Yankees? They outpitched you. They, they did everything better than you do. And you know, Dick Schofield said, I'm tired of hearing this. We could have played the New York Yankees all summer. We would have ended up winning one more game than that's the confidence that these 1960 Pittsburgh Pirates have. Now, we talked about the color barrier in baseball being broken in 1947 when Branch Rickey signed Jackie Robinson. Before that, people of color were not permitted to play Major League Baseball. They had their own league. This is 1960. 1960, the Pittsburgh Pirates, here's a picture of the team. Many people are on the mistaken belief that after 1947, baseball opened their arms and welcomed people of color to baseball. Nothing could be further from the truth. You have an opportunity to look at this picture of the 1960 Pittsburgh Pirates. I see three people of color on that team, and only three. There's Roberto Clemente, there's Joe Christopher, a reserve outfielder, and Gene Baker, a reserve infielder. That was it. The last team to integrate Major League Baseball. Does anybody know? Boston Red Sox. Do you know who the player was? That I don't know. Pumpsy Green. Outstanding. You get, a, you get an award there. <laughs> 1959. It's 12 years after the color barrier is broken, and Boston finally gets around to promoting a player of color to their team. Some people say they did it because they realized the error of their way and wanted to be magnanimous. Other people say that they did it because the other team talent wise and the American League were passing them by, so they had to do it. Whatever the reason was. Baseball was slow to integrate. Now the Pirates made significant progress. You're not going to be able to see that in the dark. They made significant progress 
in the next 11 years. This is the 1971 Pittsburgh Pirates. We'll be talking about them a little bit later. When you look at that team, there are 11, 12 people. They're either black and or Hispanic on the team. I was watching the highlights of the 1971 World Series a couple of weeks ago. How sad is my life? And they were introducing the starting lineups, game seven, the Baltimore Orioles and the Pittsburgh Pirates. When they were introducing the Pittsburgh Pirates, this is 1971 World Series, game seven, seven of the players were either black or Hispanic. The only two who weren't was the starting pitcher, Steve Blass, and Bobby Robertson, the uh, first baseman. That was it. So the Pirates made significant progress in that area. <clears throat> All right, now it's 1968. Now prior to that, 19, one more thing about 1960. They had the All-Star voting in 1960. Roberto had a phenomenal season in 1960. Dick Grote was voted the most valuable player in the National League. Roberto Clemente was eighth as far as the balloting is concerned. This upset Roberto Clemente. Not that Roberto expected to be the most valuable player, but he knew he was better than eighth as far as the balloting was concerned. And this kind of just motivated him. 1961 was his breakout season. It was his first of four batting titles, his first of 12 consecutive gold gloves for fielding excellence. Everybody knows his other stats, 3,000 hits, 240 home runs. But the stat that surprises me the most is Roberto Clemente led the league in outfield assists five seasons. And I'm wondering, why is the National League still running on him with his arm? That he would lead the league in outfield assists for five times. 1966, he's voted most valuable player. And we're talking about 1968 now. It's 1968, it's the movie contract for the movie The Odd Couple. It was presented to Roberto Clemente. Again. Okay. If you're familiar with the movie The Odd Couple, it starred Walter Matthau as Oscar Madison, a grumpy, slovenly sports writer, and Felix Unger, Jack Lemon at the particular time, he was a professional photographer, kind of fastidious and neat -nick. These two live together, so they're always at loggerheads. One, one scene in the movie was actually filmed at Shea Stadium by the actual players with the game. It was the Pittsburgh players, the Pirates playing the New York Mets. They used the players before the game to film the scene. If you have an opportunity, you go to YouTube, you type in Odd Couple Movie Triple Play. The scene only lasts a minute and 48 seconds. It's hilarious. Well, the scene, the set of the scene is, you have Oscar Madison, the sports writer. He's sitting watching the game, sitting next to another sports writer. They're watching the game. It's the top of the ninth. The Pirates have the bases loaded. Nobody's out. The other sports writer turns to Oscar Madison and says, that's it. The Mets are going to lose this game. There's no way they'll hold a one-run lead against the Pirates with bases loaded and nobody out. Oscar Madison jokingly says, ah, maybe the Pirates are hit into a triple play. So you know what's coming. Just then there's a phone behind him and the phone rings. The one sports writer gets up, he answers the phone and says, Oscar, it's for you. Oscar says, I'm watching the game, I can't take a phone call. But the guy says it's an emergency. So, Oscar Madison gets up, it's an emergency. He takes the message, takes the phone, and his back's to the game. So you know what's going to happen. Who's on the phone? His roommate, Felix Unger. What's Felix's emergency? Oscar, don't eat any more frankfurters. I'm making beans and franks for dinner. That's his emergency. <laughs> While he's telling him this, a roar goes up for the crowd. You know what happened. The Pirates are getting into a triple play, and Oscar is missing. So he's screaming, the Felix, I'm going to kill you. Well, that's the scene. The directors and producers want Roberto Clemente to hit into this triple play. Now, I've, had third, I've heard three reasons why Roberto didn't sign the contract. Number one is when he found out that he had any triple play, he says, Clemente doesn't need any triple plays. <laughs> Number two, I've heard, and I can't verify this, but they actually started filming the scene because they filmed this with the players before the game. They started out with Roberto. Roberto hits the ball down to third base. It's a round the hole, round the hole in third, triple play. Third baseman touches third base, throws a second base in first base. Roberto Clemente is crossing first base before the ball gets there. Director says, cut. Mr. Clemente, and I can't verify this happened or not, could you please slow down? And Roberto Clemente says, no, Roberto Clemente is. <laughs> the third reason I heard, which is probably the reason, when Roberto found out he had to hit into a triple play, he says, you're not going to buy me cheap. And they couldn't come to an agreement as far as money is concerned. So who do they get to do it? Bill Mazeroski. Oh. And 
The scene opens with a long shot of Shea Stadium, and you hear the announcer in the background saying, now batting for the Pittsburgh Pirates, number nine, second baseman, Bill Mazeroski. Okay, turn this. Okay, here's a picture of Bob Gibson. Bob Gibson is a Hall of Fame pitcher in the 1960s, played against Roberto Clemente. This gives you kind of a flavor for Roberto Clemente and some of the outstanding top flight pitchers he appeared in. Bob Gibson was, by reputation, a fierce competitor. On the inside of the plate was a fierce competitor. Players, a lot of players lived in fear of him. To get an example of how tough a competitor he was, his teammate, Tim McCarver. Tim McCarver is a longtime announcer as far as baseball. He was a catcher for the Cardinals. He tells a story. The story goes that Bob Gibson is having an uncharacteristic poor outing. Tim McCarver is the catcher. So Tim McCarver gets a sign from the bench that he's got to go out and talk to Bob Gibson and kind of delay so they can get a relief pitcher warmed up. So McCarver, I'm sure he's thinking, you know, I'd sooner iron my face than do this because Bob Gibson certainly to begin with, he's getting hammered so he's even angry. So McCarver said he gets up, he starts walking to the mound, Bob Gibson glares at him and says, McCarver, what the blank do you want? The only thing you know about pitching is you can't hit. So this is how Bob Gibson treats his own team. So this is a game against the Pittsburgh Pirates. And Bob Gibson is pitching inside, brushing a lot of the Pirates back. So the Pirate bench is getting angrier and angrier. And according to Manny Moda, who was on this time, on his team, he says, Roberto Clemente said, then I'm going to break his leg. Okay. Roberto Clemente comes to bat, hits a screaming line drive, bounces up Bob Gibson's leg. Bob Gibson goes down. They get that spray, shh, the spray kind of numbs a little bit. Bob Gibson pitches a couple more batteries before the leg breaks. He had broke, fractured his bone, and then actually fractured he went down. Now, did Roberto Clemente purposely hit a line drive back to Bob Gibson because he was pitching inside, or was this just a serendipitous occasion? I don't know what it is, but according to Manny Moe, Roberto said that he was going to break his leg. Okay, next one. You're going the wrong way. Don Drysdale, another outstanding pitcher in the 50s and 1960s, faced Roberto Clemente quite frequently. Again, in the tech. big guy, six foot five, over 200 pounds. Now we're all six five, 200 pounds. Back in the 50s and 60s, he was a big guy. Another intense competitor on the inside of the plate. Give you an idea how fierce competitor he was. The Dodgers were playing the Cardinals one game. A Cardinal catcher by the name of Gene Oliver hits a home run off Don Drysdale. Now back in the day when you hit a home run, there was no hot dog in the bat clipping. You put your head down, you ran around the bases, and got into the dugout as quickly as possible. For some reason, Gene Oliver has a brain cramp. He flips the bat in the air, looks at the Cardinal dugout, and screams, Bat boy, come get the bat, and leisurely runs around the bases against Don Drysdale. Next time Gene Oliver comes up in that game, guess what happens? Don Drysdale drills him. Gene Oliver is writhing in the dirt. Don Drysdale takes two steps toward the St. Louis Cardinal dugout and screams, Bat boy, come get Oliver. <laughs> give you an idea what a fierce competitor. Now, 1969 is toward the end of Don Drysdale's career. He's contemplating retirement. They're playing the Pittsburgh Pirates. Roberto Clemente is up. He hits a screaming line drive that Don Drysdale said he heard buzz as it went by his ear. Drysdale, I'm sure, took a deep breath, got the Robin bag, brushes his ear off as a fly bother him, brushes his fly off again, looks at his finger and there's blood on his finger. The ball had taken the skin off the top of his ear. Uh -huh. The only thing Drysdale could think was, you know, if that ball had been in a couple of more inches, it might be a little bit different. Next batter up is supposedly Manny Sandian. It's a two-run home run. Don Drysdale exits the game, and I believe that was the last game that Don Drysdale pitched before retirement. Now, I'm not saying that Roberto Clemente and the Pittsburgh Pirate caused Don Drysdale to retire, but I'm sure that was in the back of his mind when he was doing that. Okay, no. All right, 1971. We talked a little bit about the 1971 World Series. Have you ever seen a highlight reel of the 1971 World Series? It should read the Roberto Clemente highlight reel. <laughs> Roberto did everything in that World Series except manage the concession stands. He hit for power, he hit for average. He did everything in that World Series. He's probably the main reason why the Pirates, who had to win four of the last five games to be World Series champions, were the World Series champions. Here's a celebration there. We have Manny Sanguian. We have Steve Blast kowtowing to him. We've got some Pirate pitches right here. And I'm not sure here, but 
Looks like Bob Johnson might be holding a pistol here. I'm not sure. <laughs> Why would he have a pistol on the clubhouse? I don't know. Well, as I said, Roberto Clemente is the most valuable player in the 71 World Series. Now, the Pirates lost the first two games in that series, so we know they had to win four of the next five, which they did. After the series is over, they're talking to Earl Weaver. Earl Weaver is the manager of the Baltimore Orioles. They're asking him, hey, Earl, what was the turning point of the series? We had a stranglehold on the Pittsburgh Pirates. What changed it? Thinking it was maybe one of Roberto's home runs or one of his phenomenal fielding plays. This is the play that Earl Weaver describes as the turning point. It's game three. The series, the first two games was in Baltimore. It's a three-rower stadium. Roberto Clemente is a bat. Roberto hits a check swing comebacker to the Baltimore Oriole pitcher. The Baltimore Oriole pitcher's name was Mike Quayle. And again, got to tell you that the 1971 World Series, American League champion Baltimore Orioles were prohibitive favorites. They were going to beat the Pirates soundly. The Pirates didn't have a chance. This is the third consecutive year that the Orioles in the World Series. They're defending World Series champions. They're loaded. Brooks Robinson, Frank Robinson, Boom Pile. They have four 20-game winners in the same year on their 1971 team. For example, last year in Major League Baseball, in all Major League Baseball, there was only three 20-game winners. Now I realize back in the 70s, starters stayed in the longer, and there were four men as opposed to five men rotation. The four 20-game winners is outstanding. Pirates don't have a chance. So, they're asking Earl Weaver, what was the turning point of the series? And this is the play he describes. Mike Quayer is on the mound, throws a pitch, Roberto hits a comebacker to the mound. Mike Quayer fields the ball, he knows Roberto from in his fast, so he knows he's going to, it's a sense of urgency. He turns, and I guess he didn't think Roberto was going to run as fast as he was running, because I think kind of another, or nerve Quayer, he throws wide to first base, Roberto's sick. He throws wide to first base. Roberto's safe. Next batter up is Willie Stargell. Willie Stargell gets a walk. Roberto Clemente's on second base. Willie Stargell's on first base. Out comes Bob Robertson, power hitting first baseman for the Pittsburgh Pirates. Right handed hit. Now, Earl Weaver, the manager of the Orioles, doesn't want Bob Robertson to hit a ball down the left field line for extra bases and score Roberto and Willie Stargell. So he has Brooks Robinson, the third baseman, playing back, and he's guarding the left field line by third base. Danny Murtaugh, the power manager, sees this and wants Bob Robertson to bunt. Bob Robertson said he didn't think he was asked to bunt in his entire career. But it doesn't matter because Bob Robertson misses the sign. When you see field footage of this, you see Roberto Clemente on second base, he's doing jumping jacks. He must time out. There's a bunt on? It doesn't matter. The umpires. Don't see Roberto, he doesn't get time out. So Bob Robertson, who's supposed to bunt, promptly hits a three-run home run. <laughs> As he's rounding the base, Bob Robertson, he's feeling pretty good about himself. This is the third game of the series. The Bucklers know they have to win this game because up at that top, till that time, no team has gone three, down three games from them in the World Series and come back to win. It's late in the game. The Pirates are comfortably ahead. He's feeling good about himself. He crosses on plate. Willie Starge is there, shakes his hand and says, wait a bunt, Bob. Bob Robertson said that his heart sunk in his chest. Now he's going to go in the dugout and explain to his manager why he didn't listen to directions. So Bobby Robertson said he eventually worked up enough courage and he approaches Danny Murtaugh. He's sitting on the bench. His cap's down over his eyes. He's laughing. He says something to the effect, she skipped by Mr. Sign, to which Danny Murtaugh barks back to him, yeah, Mr. Sign. But needless to say, there were no negative repercussions because after all, he did hit a three-run home run. Again. Okay, it's 1972. Roberto Clemente is approaching his 3,000th hit. Up until this time, only 10 players in Major League Baseball have accumulated more than 3,000 hits. And as the season progressed, people would interview Roberto and even ask him about, what are you going to do when you get your 3,000th hit? And he would always start by saying something like, God willing. Because remember, he always had a sense of urgency as far as the life is concerned. He had a feeling that he was going to die young. So, it's the last regular season series of the 1972 season. The Pirates are playing the New York Mets at Three River Stadium. This is the first game of the series. Now, Roberto was using the same model bat but made by two different companies, Adirondack and Louisville Slugger. Louisville Slugger has offered Roberto Clemente $3,000 if he uses their bat to get his 3,000 kick. Well, Roberto's a prideful individual, and he doesn't want people thinking that 
use that because you want, someone said use this bad things, I'll give you 3,000 bucks. There'd be no doubt about what bad I'm using. But I'm not going to burn it So there's film footage. There was a young family there, and the guy was taking home movies. Now, when we have an open house, and our next open house at the museum is going to be the day before Father's Day, because Father's Day doesn't go. Huh? He was taking film footage. There's no sound to it, but at the open house upstairs, we have about a 30 minute film on loop of Roberto Clemente, and the film footage from that home movie's on. You see Roberto Clemente, he's in the corner of the dugout, and he's laboring over two, three bats. He brings three bats onto the on deck circle. Willie Stargell's already on the on deck circle. You know, Willie Stargell's kneeling down. Roberto puts all three bats in front of Willie Stargell. Willie Stargell grabs the first bat, hits it on the ground a couple of times, grabs the second bat, hits it on the ground a couple of times. Takes a third bat, hits it on the ground a couple of times, hands it to Roberto, and nods his head, yes. No sound. Roberto takes that bat and gets a double off Jan Matlack for the New York Mets. Turn, next one. Okay. Everybody's seen this picture. Roberto coming, he's on second base, tipping his hat to the adoring fans, all 150,000 who say they were there. Despite the fact the official attendance was about 13,000 for that. <laughs> Roberto Clemente has his 3,000 hit. He used the Louisville Slugger. He earned the $3,000. So what I'm wondering is, did Willie Stargell get a cut of that or not? <laughs> I don't know. This is an actual propeller blade from the plane that Roberto Clemente was on when he tragically lost his life on December 31st, 1972. This was kept as a souvenir by one of the recovery boat captains. He passed a number of years ago. His son's going through his effects and wondering, what in heaven's name am I going to do with this? So he's donated to the museum where it's on display. Now, if you leave this presentation with anything, it's Roberto Clemente was so much more than a Hall of Fame caliber baseball player, a perennial all-star. He was a humanitarian. Roberto Clemente was in a Caribbean when his pockets filled with silver dollars. He passed them out to the poor children. He had a vision of developing what he wanted to call Sports City, a giant sports complex that would be free to the poor children of Puerto Rico, that under the guise of teaching them soccer and baseball, he teaching them more important skills like teaming and leadership. Plus, he'd have an opportunity to feed them at least once per day. He had purchased the land for Sports City, but he did not see it built because he had died. Sports City was eventually built, served the poor children of Puerto Rico for a number of decades, but has since fallen on hard times. It's no longer operational. If you're familiar with what's happening in Puerto Rico, they're in dire financial straits. So the possibility of them building Sports City back up is probably remote at this particular time. So, it's 1972, it's 1972, it's the off-season. Back in the late 60s, early 70s, the Pittsburgh Pirates are paying Roberto Clemente not to play Winter League Baseball. They don't want their team leader, the perennial all-star, getting hurt playing Winter League Baseball. So they're giving a stipend to do things like manage or scout. In 1972, he is a manager of the Puerto Rican national team in the World Series in the Caribbean, which is held in Nicaragua that year. Roberto Clemente Palos, the young, Nicar young Puerto Rican team to a third place, finish, third place finish. I think the Cubans won that year. While Roberto's in Nicaragua, he falls in love with the Nicaraguan people. He's had a way with protected children. He made arrangements, I believe, to have a child who had no legs in Nicaragua get prosthetic devices. After the series is over, Roberto goes back to his home in Puerto Rico. On December 23rd, 1972, there's a devastating earthquake in Nicaragua. Hundreds of thousands of people killed, tens of thousands homeless, millions and millions and millions of dollars worth of damage. It starts a worldwide relief effort. If you remember last summer, there was the earthquakes in Italy, and the summer before that, Nepal. They had worldwide relief efforts for the relief of those people, which I'm embarrassed to say I didn't contribute either. But anyway, there's a worldwide relief effort for the people of Nicaragua. When Roberto Clemente learns about the earthquake and the tragedy, he jumps into the relief effort with both feet. And the people of Puerto Rico, who are very, very generous, find out that Roberto Clemente, their hero, their revered one, is essentially in charge of the relief effort for Nicaragua out of Puerto Rico, supplies money pouring. Roberto commissions two airplanes of supplies and a boatload of the supplies to go to Nicaragua. When one of the airplanes comes back, he says, pilots come back, he says, Roberto, we're having some problems. Noriega, who was a military leader at the time, and his National Guard are scounding with some of these supplies. They're not getting to the people who deserve it. And this is Roberto Clemente's solution. His solution, he wasn't bragging, he wasn't being facetious. His solution is, 
I'm going to go where the next plane is. He knows that if he's on that airplane and he gets off, because he's revered all through Latin America, the first Latin American superstar as far as baseball is concerned, there's going to be no shenanigans. The supplies are going to get to where they need to go. So he's at San Juan International Airport and sees this DC-7, which is a huge airplane. To give you an idea how big it is, that's just one propeller blade that has four engines. Roberto approaches the owner, a guy by the name of Arturo Arthur Rivera. Asks can he commission his airplane for some relief supplies to, to uh, Nicaragua. Arturo's over the moon, this is fantastic. I get a contract with Roberto Clemente. They agree upon a price. What Roberto doesn't know is Arturo Rivera's history. Roberto, Arturo Rivera is a known ne'er-do-well as far as the Caribbean is concerned. He has had his commercial pilot's license revoked. At the time of the accident, he has over 66 citations against him. This DC-7 that he had bought, Arthur used to fly DC-3s, a significantly smaller airplane. So before the tragedy, he decided, you know what? If I have a bigger airplane, I can haul more supplies and make more money. He went to Miami International Airport, to a part of the airport at that time called Cockroach Corner. Cockroach Corner has decommissioned airplanes, planes for parts, planes, no pun intended, pun intended on their last legs. Planes, it's kind of like on the corner of town, you have that used car lot with $500 cars. That's Cockroach Coin. He sees this DC-7. Arthur approaches the owner and asks it for sale. The owner says, yeah, it's for sale, but Mr. Rivera, I need to tell you that the recommended flight hours for all four engines has long since expired. You should replace the engines. Arturo asks, is that a mandate? No, it's not a mandate, but you should do it. Well, Arthur's a corner cutter. He's not going to have those engines replaced. He fly, has the airplane flying back to Puerto Rico, not because he doesn't have a pilot's license. That never stopped Arturo. He can't fly DC 7s So, this is the pilot and the plane that Roberto Clemente has just commissioned for his flight. Now that people have their hands. Why didn't Roberto ask to see the pilot's license or an inspection of the plane? I'm pretty sure just about everybody in this room has flown at one time or another. Raise your hand if you've asked to see the pilot's license or inspection. You <laughs> just assume everything's okay. <coughs> people are working with that. So, Arturo Rivera has got another problem. The flight goes out on December 31st, 1972, which is New Year's Eve. Now, when people are from Puerto Rico come to Pittsburgh, many of them come to the Roberto Clemente Museum because Roberto was still revered and still a hero in Puerto Rico and Latin America. I've heard from these Puerto Rican people that if you think New Year's Eve is a big celebration in the States, it pales in comparison to what happens in Puerto Rico. So, Arturo Rivera is having trouble. He needs a pilot. He needs a flight engineer. He's going to be the co pilot. He can't find him. While he's pondering his dilemma, a guy by the name of Jerry Hill just simply happens to be walking by, looks at the DC 7, and if to no one in particular says, I used to fly DC 7s. Arturo overhears him, says, Do you want a job? He's fine. He can't find a flight engineer. He's been calling around. Eventually, he calls a guy by the name of Francisco Montes. Francisco's got a young family. I'm still asking, you want to make a little extra money? Short release supply to Nicaragua. Francisco says, yeah, I'd love to. What do I have to do? You have to be a flight engineer. Francisco reminds him, I'm not a flight engineer. I'm a mechanic. Arturo says, don't worry. No one's going to find out. He's got his crew. Roberto Clemente asks Manny Sanguin to go along. Manny Sanguin at that time was a young catcher for the Pittsburgh Pirates. Roberto Clemente has kind of adopted him as a big brother, as a mentor. Manny Sanguin can't go. Can't go. He's playing winter league baseball. Roberto asks Orlando Cepeda to go for him. Orlando Cepeda is in the Baseball Hall of Fame. Power hitting outfielder, first baseman, played for the Braves, played for the Cardinals, played for the Giants. Orlando can't go. He's toward the end of his career. He's got some injuries. He's playing winter league. Eventually, Roberto asks a friend of his, by the name of Angel Lozano, to go with him. And unfortunately for Angel, he came go. So we know who the five people on the airplane were. On the day of the flight, the people at the airport said when the airplane came out, the tires were almost flat on the ground, as if there's not enough against this airplane, it's overloaded. There's even some speculation that not only was overloaded, it wasn't secured properly. Came on, was online to take off, they have to abort the mission, they have an engine problem. They pulled the plane out of line. Remember, Francisco Mines is a mechanic. He and Jerry Hill, the pilot, work on the plane, replace some spark plugs. It comes back online again. I forgot to tell you that when they're loading the airplane up, there are two players 
two, maybe more players from the United States in Puerto Rico playing Winter League Baseball. After the plane is loaded, one of them approaches Roberto and says, hey Roberto, I'll go to Nicaragua with you and help offload this airplane. Roberto says, oh, you know, this is Puerto Rico, this is New Year's Eve, you stay, you have a good time. That player's name was Tom Walker. Tom Walker is Neil Walker's father. Neil Walker, former second baseman for the Pittsburgh Pirates, now playing for the New York Mets. So if Roberto would have said, yeah, yeah, come along, Tom Walker would have lost his life, there'd be no Neil Walker. He shows you the fine line, how fickle it can be. Manny St. Guillen and Orlando Cepeda, and Tom Walker went on that airplane, and Roberto and Angelo Zion on. So they prepared the engines, the back on line. People there said the plane barely cleared the end of the runway. The runway ended in the ocean. The plane was up for maybe five minutes when it went down. Now, there's a movie recently called Sully, Sullenberger. He's a pilot in New York who put that airplane in the Hudson River, kind of skidded it right in. And people are standing on the weeks, wait, wings waiting to go rush, get rescued. This plane didn't go in like this. This plane went in hard. They surmised that by the fact the extent of the debris field on the bottom of the ocean, and the plane was broken up into small pieces. They only found one body, Jerry Hill, the pilot, he was strapped in his seat. They said that the injuries his body sustained was like a smash into a brick wall. They didn't find Roberto, they didn't find anybody else. Who knows, shark infested water, riptides, currents, underground caverns. Who knows what happened to the bodies. They did find Roberto's briefcase and the sock of Jarrett's might have been Roberto's. When the border, people of Puerto Rico found out that Roberto Fermenti, their hero, their revered one was gone, there was disbelief. They flocked to the ocean, hundreds of thousands of them, waiting. Waiting for what? For Roberto to come swimming in out of the water, come paddling in some debris, to be on one of those recovery boats. He just couldn't be gone. There has to be some kind of closure, but we know there was no closure. They had many memorial services, but they had the memorial services soon after at a small chapel near the airport. Vera and her three sons did not make the service on time. There was such a crush of people who wanted to be there, they couldn't negotiate through the people to get there on time. All the Pittsburgh Pirates were down there. Steve Blass, former Pittsburgh Pirate pitcher, now announcer for the Pirates, did the eulogy. All the Pirates were there but one. Manny Sanguine was not there at the service. Now you may think, Pins. I thought Roberto was like his mentor, his, his big brother. He was. Manny had donned a wetsuit. He was a part of the recovery effort. He had said that if it had been me on that airplane, Roberto would be out looking for me. Hal Oliver, so well put, it was a shame that it took Roberto to lose his life for people to realize he was so much more than an all star caliber baseball player. The man was a humanitarian. One more. Okay, that ends my talk on Roberto Clemente. If you have any questions or comments, I'd be happy to entertain them at this time before we go to our lottery. Where's the ball? Come on now. Where's the ball? Any questions, comments? All right, everybody get their save their tickets now. Vince, there's a hand up. Oh, where? Yes. I just want to make a comment. I was knocked on my ass by Roberto Clemente. You were? How so? I, my dad, we used to go to the airport to get a place to come back from a flight. He used to be on the news and were coming in, and we would go down and get autographs. Yeah. Well, it was at the old airport, the old yeah. thing. So I went down the back way. I was trying to sneak down the back way. How old were you? I was about 14. And uh, I was sort of like glass blocks there, and I was like running down the corner. And he was coming up. He was trying to get away from the back way. And he was coming up double steps, like running. Yeah. Just as I came around the corner, he knocked me on my ass, and I went flying. And he came over, you know, and yeah. picked me up. I know I was okay, and he had on a um, plaid, like sports coat and a battle on his shirt. Uh -huh. and talking to me. And before I knew it, he was. He said, "You okay?" And I, he got me up, and he yeah. he left. Then I realized who it was. <laughs> so then, then I finally got done. I only got one autograph. It was Don Schwal. Okay, yeah. Okay. So anyway, I lost his autograph through the years. Okay. 
Yeah, so a friend of mine, we went down to see the uncovering of Billy Mazeroski. Okay, yeah. So who do you think is there? Yeah, now, Don Schwab. Don Schwab. So I got a picture of Don Schwab, he signed a dollar bill for me. <laughs> Too bad you don't have a Roberto Comenio on it. We had a uh, police officer, a retired police officer at the museum. He said when he was a kid, he had Roberto Comenio autograph a baseball. Now, Roberto Comenio signed a lot of autographs in his career, but not nearly as much as current players do. Current former players. It was baseball card memorabilia shows, and he signed thousands and thousands and thousands of autographs. Roberto signed a lot of autographs, but he never had an opportunity to take care of it. So this police officer was saying he has a baseball with Roberto Clemente's autograph. However, during the years, the autographs started to fade. So his mother, God rest her soul, got out of pen and traced over the world. Now, from a memorabilia standpoint, the ball is essentially worthless. However, it still means a little bit to that police officer because he knew Roberto signed it, and his dear mother, no good deed goes unpunished, did sign over that <laughs> All right, do we have our, our first? Here we have a Bill Mazeroski Hall of Fame commemorative plate. Oh, this is a good one, guys. All right, and the winning number is, last three numbers are 482. Four, eight, oh! Take care of my guy here. <laughs> the fix is in. Next. And let somebody else have it. Call another one. Oh. <laughs> Four, seven, six. Courtesy of John. Oh, All right, pass that down. Check her number, make sure she's not cheating. All right, next. Kent to call me. 1979, we are family figurines. This is, this is a good one. Wonder where your life was before this. Okay, the winning number is 483. Congratulations. This is free heart treatment. These are courtesy of the Roberto Community Museum. Next, we have a book. Roberto Community Book. Great book, got some great pictures. The winning number is 453. Congratulations. Since there was so much enthusiasm about that, we have another book. The winning number is 459. There you go. Congratulations. Thank you. I think I've got one more box if you're going over. Well. <laughs> Some phenomenal photographs in this book, guys. All right. Winning number is, cross your fingers, 475. There you go. There you go. Maybe you can dodge your ball to sign. Did he sign it? Yeah, the, the matter of fact, he is. Keep looking. Got some posters here. A lot of pictures taken by Les Banos. Les Banos was a close person friend of Roberto Clemente, was a photographer for the Pittsburgh Pirates. Les Banos said that the Immaculate Reception saved his life. Now you think it wins. You have a senior moment. The Immaculate Reception was a football player. Go ahead. The Steelers are playing the Oakland Raiders in this playoff on December 23rd, 1972. You all know what the Immaculate Reception is. Franco catches that ball before it hits the turf, scores a touchdown. The Steelers win the game, the playoff game against the Oakland Raiders. Prior to the game, Roberto Clemente contacts Les Banos and says, Les, I want you to come down to Puerto Rico and go with me to a flight to Nicaragua. I'll take your camera, we'll take some photographs, publish the pictures, there'll be renewed interest in the relief effort, more supplies and money will flow in. Les Banos says, I'd be happy to do that, dear friend. He's got his plan. It also happens at that time that Les Banos is also the Steelers photographer. The Steelers win that playoff game, so they get a game the next week. They're playing the Miami Dolphins. That was the 17-0 Miami Dolphins. The Steelers lose that game. But last, 
Thanos can't go. He's got to stay and photograph the students. Again, just to show you how fickle it is, guys like Manny Sanguin, Les Banos, Orlando Saban aren't on that flight, and others are real. So, that being up, we've got some posters here, pictures from Les Banos, and the winning number is, and after that build up, you're going to be very excited, 464. <laughs> <laughs> and we've got some posters here, guys, that if you wanted one of these, you could have taken them on your way out the door. We've got some more posters here. And the winner is 47. Wow, take care of the front row here, huh? I've got an old school bobblehead here. Oh, got a chip in. I think he was shaving. He cut himself shaving. When you take the bobblehead out of the ball, don't pull him by his head because the spring will stretch. <laughs> it's a tight fit here. Okay. The winner of the old time bobblehead is three ninety five. That person snuck out three ninety. There. Well, it took you long enough. Better check that ticket. <laughs> <laughs> Two free passes to the Roberto Clemente Museum. Easy to get to. Just go through the strip district. It's on Penn Avenue, right before you enter Shady Stump. Lawrenceville, where the Doughboy statue is. It's immediately on the left side. Free park. Winning number is 466. Congratulations. We'll see you at the museum. I've got two more passes. <laughs> Winning number is 467. Did you get it? Yeah, you did get it. I have a feeling I'm definitely going to see you. You have no idea what a Kalani fan I am. You're going to love it. You're going to love it. Which one do you guys want to go with? Husband or best friend? Okay, it's your last chance, guys. Mystery in his little bag. And the last winner of the day is 396. You can't win, boys. She, she, she brought a date. <laughs> I want to thank you very much for your attention. If you had a belly full of me when you scheduled your tour, you'd say, anybody but Vince. <laughs> that other tour guys. And when you're scheduling a tour, you have to call in advance for a reservation. On our tour, we have a lot of memorabilia awards that are out on display. And most people are very, very honest, but why take a chance? And like I mentioned, there's an open house at the museum on the day before Father's Day in June. We can come in on that Saturday and go to the museum at your leisure. You don't need an appointment. Again, thank you very much for coming out.